Welcome to Jazz Life with Rhonda Hamilton, and I am so happy to have as my guest today a great lady and a great friend, Carmen Lundy. It's always good to see you, Carmen. Rhonda, it's great to see you too. Yes. You know, when I think of you, I think of artist. I mean, you are a complete artist, in my opinion. Creativity is always flowing out of you. And music, obviously, is your first love but you're also a visual artist, a, a multimedia visual artist, an actress, and, and a songwriter. Just as you are prolific as a, as a visual artist, you are extraordinarily uh, prolific as a songwriter. And you have a new album out. What is the name of it? Modern Ancestors. Modern Ancestors. Now, how did you come to that title? The modern part was important because I realized that I'm writing as a jazz singer so I'm thinking, well, jazz singers and the music that we're, we're mostly connected with is the music of the time before now. We're talking all the great standards, Billie Holiday and all her great songs and, and everything that's happened since then. So modern had to do with placing me, Carmen Lundy, in this century. Ancestors was because of everything I just mentioned, Billie and everything that comes before me and all that information. So I wanted to acknowledge the, the, not so much the beginnings of the music, but those people who are actually, that we've watched on stage ourselves. So I thought about how lucky I was to be able to see Ella perform and to see Betty Carter perform and Carmen McCray and Nina Simone and all the way up to Jerry Allen, you know, Mulgrew, Roy Hargrove. So to me, the ancestor point is really before those who have just passed even in the last year or so. So modern ancestors, this kind of says, I've been in it for the love of the music. Yes, and for a long time. This is what, your 16th album, right? 15, I 15, think it's 15. 15th album, okay, we're getting there close. Your, your 15th album, and it's funny, you mentioned standards a little earlier. And as I was looking at your discography, a lot of your earlier recordings, the titles were titles of standards. But at one point in your career, you stopped that, and you started writing your own your own material. Yeah. And now you've composed and published over 100 songs, well over 100 songs, that's, which is quite an accomplishment. Fact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I began to think about it. I said, well, wait a second. Who are those artists that have original songs that have added to the jazz lexicon? I thought about Billy and, you know, God Bless the Child. I thought about Good Morning Heartache, and which is why Good Morning Kiss is the name of my first album, because... We already had Good Morning Heartache, and I thought, let's go to the positive. Well, that's great. That's something I never knew. <laughs> yes. Good Morning Kiss, taking inspiration from Good Morning Heartache. Yes, and I wanted to go to the positive side of that start of your day. I thought, okay, Nancy Wilson's got, guess who I saw today? That's her great offering. She didn't write it, but it didn't matter. It's her she, signature song. It's her signature song. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what's my signature song? I think that's a sign always of a great jazz artist, is how they interpret the stand. And when you bring something different to it, it really it really stands out. But this has been really challenging, taking a body of new songs to the audience around the world. But it's been such an arc. I mean, we're talking 20, 30 plus years now. And I gotta say, I can go to these places around the world and they expect to hear the songs that, that I've written. Yes. More so than the standard. So it's been a beautiful arc to, well, to come to this point. You've really established yourself that way. And, and the proof of your talent as a songwriter is that many other people have recorded your songs. Yes, yes, that's really, I mean, what could be better than that? That somebody digs your tune and they cover it? Yes, yes, and it's a wonderful thing. And you've written so many wonderful songs and some of the songs on this new release actually go back many years. Yes, right? yes. But uh, let, let's talk about Jerry Allen for a minute because you mentioned Jerry when you were talking about Modern Ancestors and I know she really uh, was part of the inspiration for this recording. Uh, Jerry was such uh, a, a, a great person, a great artist. She was someone who was very giving. She was a good friend of yours. I can remember uh, hearing about Jerry. I heard about, you know, um, again, it's just like the 80s. And to hear about another female coming on the jazz scene, and that's important, that's good, and that's great. For me, having some, that special time with a player like Jerry uh, is somewhere in my music. I'd like to think so. You know, I didn't know Jerry very well. I knew her. She was a shy person, as you said. But I always felt 
even though she was shy and rather quiet, that there was there was a depth to her. There was something very deep inside of her and, and wisdom that she that she possessed. Talking about her uh, and sharing with the audience how important she is to me artistically and friendship-wise. Hopefully, you know, you'll check her out. If you don't know who we're talking about, the great Jerry Allen, the pianist and composer, uh, and songwriter. Yes. So you mentioned Clear Blue Skies. It's one of the songs on your new release, mm -hmm. inspired by Jerry Allen. Mm -hmm. And you begin the album with a, a, a piece called A Time for Peace. And was that song motivated by anything in particular? <laughs> uh, sometime an idea or motivation is instant. You just feel it, and there it is. And other times you just work on it and work and work and work and work and work. And I think it was one of those moments where I might have been working on Clear Blue Skies and um, I'm starting to do a time for peace, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, why can't I do something like in, within a phrase? Why can't I just maybe make half of the phrase a minor thing and half of the phrase a major and go back and forth from minor to major? And it, it's kind of worked, it kind of didn't work. But I wanted to also keep everything simple on this record. Well, yes, I can sing, you know, heavy duty bebop line, or, but I, I didn't know, I didn't feel that way about this record. I felt like everything was such a simple rendering. And, I, and having so many other recordings before me, and just an example of what I do, I really kind of felt liberated to just uh, keep things a little bit more simple. Maybe they don't sound that way. To, to the to everyone else, but for me, I have to something that's go to a really simple place and try to have a more direct line of, to the listener that um, reaches more of that sharper point of us. I don't know, something like that. Well, I like I like the way that song gets, especially in the end, the layering of the voices that you do, all your own voices, and it, it almost sounds like some kind of I don't know controlled chaos there at the end. You know the way the way the song resolves itself. Um, also, in that song, it's a perfect example. You're talking about the layers and the my voices, extra voices. That's one where I did a lot of pre-recording. So I actually recorded a lot of of that music that you're hearing prior to the actual day we were in the recording studio with the rhythm section. It was a wonderful way to, to go into this project, pre-recording, working out a lot of the ideas in my studio and recording all of it, including the drums. I remember Terry on saying, so Carmen, are we gonna actually mute the drums that are on the track when we get to the studio? I said, of course we are. He had no idea it was me. <laughs> so this is Terry on Gully. Though. Yeah, Terry on Gully, uh -huh. our drummer. Uh -huh. He had no idea that the demo I sent him was me on the drum. This is a matter of uh, their having listened to the stuff I sent, listened to the pre-recordings, listened to my demos, but actually hearing themselves in the music in such a way that they knew that we could take that, uh, uh, do a live version and come up with uh, the result being Ola de Calor was recorded live. The Cuban culture, the Latin music. I was like exploring, how can I sing in another language and also sing in English and have it be understood by whoever's listening, Spanish speaking or not. Well, you said that song, uh, Ola de Calor, uh, really uh, also relates to you growing up in, in Miami and being exposed to a lot of Cuban culture. The Cuban culture, the Latin music. I started gigging, my professional career began in Miami at around 1972. And around 1975, okay, three years, and, the, and all my bands were always piano, bass, drums, guitar. Rarely horns at that time. And maybe the, the maybe the decor, closer to like late 70s, I had trumpet, sax, and all the other stuff. But in the, in between there, I hired a Cuban guy that I met at the University of Miami on drums. His name is Oscar Salas. And he was also a, a hand percussionist. So one night, Oscar had one of his friends sit in. I'm in the middle of the tune, and the sound changes behind me. And I realize I've got drums and percussion. I look back, and there's someone else on congas. And it's Myra Casales playing congas. So now Myra and I struck up a friendship immediately. 
Oh, do you know Tito Puente? Do you know Paguito? And Iraquere, I'm hearing they were huge back then, yes. Iraquere. So now I'm introduced to this other end of the music, thanks to Dizzy Gillespie and John Pozo, and all that history, not being aware of the extension of it. And here it is, like on my bandstand now. So, Oba de Calor is a throwback to, to all that early introduction to the music, and particularly the dance. It's all about dance. Mm -hmm. It's all about dance. Oh, you really grew up hearing more gospel music, right? Your mother was a heavy gospel duty. singer. Mm -hmm. Heavy duty gospel. Right. I mean, I can remember there was a patch in my life where I think I was maybe in a church five days a week for about two years. And um, my mother was, a, she and another vocalist in that apostolic singers, they had all the leads. As a child, I would watch them work on their their arrangements and no, your note is this and no, yes, your note, you know, that kind of thing. And then I would be in church the next night and that song they were rehearsing would slay everybody. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I know those notes and maybe they'll let me sing with them. So I'm thinking that I was going to grow up and become a member of my mother's group. Yeah. You have a song, Burned Down, on this record that relates to oh. that aspect of your life. And it seems like there's a personal story that is connected with that song as well. Uh, watching my family struggle, uh, the African American experience in America that I was born into, and I don't even think I realized how deep that was. I don't think I realized how deep it was uh, until I got older. Uh, but to know the struggles of my grandparents and watch my family struggle that way. And then my mother developed an illness in the 90s. And uh, I think that's when I wrote that tune, it was actually the late 90s. But I was singing in that. And that's the way it is. Burden Down was more of a reflection. Uh, and also, it's very timely, interestingly enough. There's something about singing it now. That was the other one that they said, let's do this live. <laughs> I knew I was gonna do live, and I was nervous about it. Because the song was so personal, which is the, also the risk, I think, when you're being a, when you're a songwriter, I think you're putting a lot of your, yourself and revealing a lot of yourself. And it was so personal. I just, I just, uh, it took me a while. It took me a long time to just, and, and, and actually, the producer, co-producer on the record, Elizabeth Uwe, said, what about that song, Burden Down? Because she'd heard it mm -hmm. on one of my demos. And she said, what about that song, Burden Down? I thought, seriously? Because of all of that emotion. But right, you comes didn't think that you, could, you were ready to sing it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was not. It was almost like finding the courage to follow through with it. Mm -hmm. Well, you speak about suffering. There's another song on this recording called Flowers and Candles. Yeah. Tell us about that one. Flowers and Candles, coming back from a, somewhere in Europe, reading a paper and seeing a story about, oh, I think there was another terrorist attack somewhere in France or maybe Paris or maybe it was at the Nice Festival on the water. And I was reading the story about how Thaddeus kid was so frightened by this terrorist experience being out at a festival or something and then all hell breaks loose. And then the next day, you're kind of looking at these memorials popping up and flowers on the sidewalk and next to the fence with all the faces, you know, pinned to the fence and that kind of image. And I'm reading this story about the dad trying to explain to the little three-year-old why are all these candles and flowers here? And you can see from, from the, the story that the father is struggling with trying to explain it. And finally the little kid goes, so, you mean the flowers and the candles are here to protect us? And the, the dad goes, that's it, yeah, that's it. That's what they're here for. And I just was so touched by that. I don't know, I was just, I don't know, it was just kind of another one of those things where the melody was there mm -hmm. and the lyric, it all was just there. Yeah. I remember seeing a photograph of the attack in Paris and someone had, well, put, little candles on the ground, on the sidewalk, spelling out the word Paris. Mm. And then you see all the flowers all around, all the bouquets of flowers all around and more candles. And there is a photograph of a little boy. He looks like he's about three years old <laughs> looking at this. And you have to 
wonder what is he thinking because it's hard enough to explain these kind of attacks to adults. How do you explain it to a three-year-old? This record means a lot in that, in a sense, it's, it has a simplistic, honest rendering from song to song, a feeling of, okay, of ease, of of accepting, kind of allowing myself to be with something rather than overanalyzing, mm -hmm. because I think that's part of the tricky part to being the creative entity, mm -hmm. is that sometimes you can just be so analytical uh, that you might spoil it. Mm -hmm. You might spoil some of that raw, honest emotion. Mm -hmm. Well, on a lighter note, you have a song called Jazz on TV. <laughs> yes. On this release. Which yes. is which is one of it's one of those really catchy melodies that I think people immediately, you know, uh, relate to. And and as I've been listening to your recording over and over again, uh, it's 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 like the thing with standards because now I I'm becoming more and more familiar with the music. And I, I find, oh, I really like this song. And I'm like, oh, I didn't hear that the first time. You know? uh -huh. And so, you know, it, it's, it starts to grow on you. But Jazz on TV was one of the ones that, and I think you said other people have said it, yes. that immediately, um, well. <laughs> that immediately uh, catches people's interest. Yes. Not only because of the uh, content of it, but the, the melody. The, the melody group. itself? It, yeah, well, you know, I can remember on AM radio, they always had a jingle for that. What do you call it? The calling letter? The call yes, letters? Yes, the call letters, yeah. Yeah. So, I can remember W-F-U-N, you know, and that was a station that I listened to as a kid. W-F-U-N, W-F-U-N, you know. <laughs> so, looking for jazz on TV. I was yes, looking yes, for that same yes. kind of idea. Because I have this, I have this beat, and I'm, I'm a little frustrated after spending almost 50 years in the business, professionally, consistently, that I don't see myself on TV. I don't see my music on television. I don't see where people are featuring artists that play jazz on television. So I wanted to kind of sound a little cynical, but I also wanted to sound a little humorous about about this idea. So that got us to thinking, and Elizabeth said, well, why don't you write about that? Why don't you write a song about that? So there I was, like at the 11th hour, I thought I was done with this project. I really thought I had written all the music, and we were ready to plan this next recording session. And then this idea came up and I thought, oh, what am I gonna do? Are you serious? Because I had this other tune that was a tune that Jerry and I had recorded on the Come Home CD. And once when Elizabeth suggested jazz on TV, it was like, boop, scrap. You know, and I, that's, that's trippy because you're kind of committed to something. You've got your whole plan and if everything is, but that's what jazz is. You come to the stage and you got so and so laid out, and next thing you know, the music starts, everybody plays, and other things happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of, I think, the creative side and being open, and also receiving ideas. Yeah. Well, the the idea behind it too uh, is something that we hope will win. Is it's a winning idea because jazz is a music that people need. They might not even realize it now, but you need this music and a lot of people don't have the opportunity to to hear it or experience what jazz is. And I was saying on the radio the other day, talk about the jazz message. It's a message of, of, of healing, of, of unifying people, uh, of, of love, of spirituality, and that's something that everybody is longing for today. And we have it in this music and enough people don't have the opportunity to experience what what jazz is, you know, Particularly what the jazz, jazz artists can, can bring. Can bring. We are improvisers. There's a lot more instrumental sounds in our music than there is in other pop sounds. We're very proficient uh, at our crafts. And I think when you present that to the general public, it may be a little daunting for the listener who's accustomed to hearing a lyric all the time or maybe a, a particular kind of rhythmic concept that's defined by the culture, the pop sound, the funk sound, the, the hip-hop sound. But it's interesting that jazz is all of that and then some. Yeah. It's not like we weren't on television. I mean, I've got videotapes that I cherish of all the way to Nancy Wilson show. Um, I think Barbara McNair had her own show. Yes. Nat King Cole had his own program for a long time. And all the great artists- And Sinatra artists, had a lot of people. He would have Ella and all of those people on all the time. All the time. All the time. Well, I didn't really understand how we lost 
you know, got off that track. So I look up and now it's 20, 30 years later, and I don't understand how it, it's no longer something that, uh, ha that doesn't seem to have as much value, but I, I, I think it does. But I mean, in terms of the media. So my way of, of getting back to that is really through staying true to the art form. It's not like we're going to break out and come up with some new way to get you to watch this. Just here is for now. A lot of the great people, I'm, I'm kind of right behind you, I'm staring at Miles Davis and thinking, we, you know, they're not here, but their music and their legacy is with us. And those of us who are still here um, are offering something, I think, that's as important and special, and it's our thing. It's, it's that there's something about what we're doing now that I think is kind of cool. Yeah. And sort of forward thinking as, and it's, as much. It's, it's positive and it's, it's uplifting for people. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because you don't see jazz artists on TV with any kind of regularity, but you still hear the music. The music is still there. It's, it's still very, very much part of the culture. And Oftentimes, what goes around comes around, so it just might be 2020 the year. It might start be. to see more jazz on TV. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, yeah. Another song. You have some, speaking of love songs and, and, uh, and positive messages. You have a song called Meant for Each Other and a song called Still mm -hmm. on this album. Beautiful mm -hmm. love songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember someone said, Carmen, well, you're always singing about love. And I said to them, well, I've tried singing about hate, but it, does, nobody, it, doesn't, it doesn't fly. And Meant <laughs> oh, for Each Other, that's a song that goes back. It went Meant to for the each 1980s. Other? What yes. made you want to? The songs are funny. That some They actually have their own life. They actually take on a life of their own. The song itself was written by two really great writers. Marilyn Redfield cast them all, and Julie Rayner. She had a transition that she wrote coming from Out of the Bridge back to Letter A. But that thing became the impetus for the arrangement, her little transition. So there are things like that. You work at it, you work at it, you work on the song. And I sent it to Julie and I sent it to Marilyn and they love it. And they're very happy with it, which is important too. Well, you know, it's interesting how, how things happen in time that you don't necessarily plan. There's another song on this recording called Eye of the Storm. And it was right around the time that you were recording this song that that terrible hurricane, uh, Dorian, was, uh, you know, descending upon... Actually, the calling my family. Is everybody clean? Where are you going? Are you, where's everybody staying? Are you hungered down? Are you, where are you going to a shelter? What are your plans? So I'm sitting here knowing the storm is about to hit and I just decided I need to do something with myself because I'm, I feel like I'm there in the room with them. So the song just started. I mean, it just started the, the melody just sort of happened. And then of course the lyric just is, popped out. If you listen to the beginning of that song and the end of that song, that's all about the ancestors. Mm -hmm. So we we approached it from the sense of not knowing what's coming mm -hmm. and we performed that way. Yeah. When we I, got to the end... I was just going to ask you about that because, you know, the, the line where you talk about, you know, beware of the calm before the storm, before the levee breaks. I mean, you can take that literally, but metaphorically as well. And then we have another happy song about a beautiful country, Brazil, a fair Brazil. A fair and you, Brazil. you mentioned you mentioned that it was inspired by a, a, a city in Brazil, and, and I was wondering what city. You're yeah, it's Rio. I mm -hmm. I really want to go to Bahia. Yes. Because I hear that's you know that's like hardcore, real you know where yes. everything is mm -hmm. kind of the, the roots of the music yes. are in there. Yes. Um, I've got wonderful books on the history of Jobim. And it really is a city where, at the end of the day, you can actually hear drums in the distance. You can actually hear sounds coming off the water, people playing music, and this is a, a that spontaneous combustion. I think this album really represents where you are now as an artist, all the experience that you've had in your life, all of the lessons that you've learned from the modern ancestors, and now passing it on to all of us to enjoy and to really benefit from your artistry and your experience so we always look forward to what you're doing Carmen and, and your next project but congratulations on this one Modern Ancestors it's really beautiful and so you, this album is about to come out very soon you're going to do a special album release Can so November 14 to 17 in San Francisco playing at SF Jazz we really look forward to seeing you there 
Well, thank you, Carmen, for sharing so much information about this recording and, and the creative process and all that goes into it because it's not something that you, you know, do overnight. I mean, you have worked for this for many, many years and drawn from experiences, you know, that really are very personal and, and relate back to, to your childhood. Absolutely, all of it. There's the arc and all of it. You know, I'm playing guitar on, on Affair Brazil. Yeah. A lot, all the keyboard work is me, and I'd like to mention the players on the record, if I may. Kenny Davis on bass, brother Curtis Lundy, my brother Curtis Lundy is on bass. Kenny's playing uh, acoustic and electric. And then there's Casa Overall on drums, and then there's Terry on Gully on drums. Myra Gonzalez is on percussion. Andrew Renfro, Julius Rodriguez. I think this album really represents where you are now as an artist, all the experience that you've had in your life, all of the lessons that you've learned from the modern ancestors, and now passing it on to all of us to enjoy and to really benefit from your artistry and your experience. So we always look forward to what you're doing, Carmen, and, and your next project. But congratulations on this one, Modern Ancestors. It's really beautiful. I'm going to be a star. Game shows where even losers win. It was wonderful having Carmen Lundy as our first guest on Jazz Life with Rhonda Hamilton, and I hope you'll join us again soon for our next episode. Thanks for watching. TV.